Okay, we're resuming the regular CBRD meeting. Oh, we've got some feedback. Hold on. Okay. So we went in camera to accommodate some guest speakers and we're coming back to the regular meeting. We will still, um, once resuming this regular meeting, go into in camera again. And we are still on the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. And I will read Article 30 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Military activity shall not take place in the lands or territories of Indigenous peoples unless justified by a relevant public interest or otherwise freely agreed with or requested by the Indigenous peoples concerned. States shall, shall undertake effective consultations with the Indigenous peoples concerned through appropriate procedures and in particular through their representative institutions prior to using their lands or territories for military activities. Okay, so we've already um, made the motions around uh, in camera. So we'll move to part C, adoption of minutes from the regular board meeting on March 30th. Move adoption. Second. McCollum and Morin, thank you. And is there anyone opposed to adoption of those minutes? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And we'll move on to petitions and delegations. And the first delegation we have is Comox Valley Early, Early Years Collaborative, Joanne Schroeder and Chris Johnson. Move receipt. Second. Hillian and Grieve, thank you. And I'll welcome our guests, Joanne and Chris. Hi, thank you for having us. I'm just checking, Joanne, are you here? I'm not seeing you on the... I am here. Okay, I great. just slipped in. Thanks, Chris. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Chris Johnson, and I'm the project lead for the Building Connections for Valley, Valley Families Project. And Joanne Schroeder is on the steering committee with the project and also part of the UBC um, HELP um, project as well, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, we're just going to tell you a little bit about our project today um, and how it will relate to the CBRD and um, we look forward to sharing this with you. Next slide please. So the project background, just in a real quick nutshell here, um, the Comox Valley Early Years Collaborative, which I'm sure many of you are familiar, is a um, group of organizations of over 40 that come to meet um, several times a year to really look at how to improve early years experiences and well-being uh, within the valley. So the, the collaborative is regularly looking at different projects and data and, and always trying to kind of assess better ways to um, support the children of the valley. But one in particular, the Early Development Index, which is done through the early, um, early Learning Partnership with the um, UBC program, is the Early Development, Development Index, which is done by kindergarten teachers. So it's very widespread through the valley and the province and kindergarten teachers sort of evaluate the different development levels of, of our kindergartners. And what we're finding um, over the last 20 years or so is that our vulnerability rates are above average here in the valley and the average in BC is, is quite high. It's over a third of children. So the um, collaborative really wanted to a launch an initiative to address this and see ways that we could um, improve these outcomes for our children before reaching kindergarten. Next slide, please. So um, the foundation of the project really is to bring everyone together, together to work together to find new opportunities to support children with play, learning opportunities, and just really building those connections either with one another or within to service providers and programs um, in the community. The project takes um, a social innovation lab approach, which is very community development model driven and tackles systems changes and, highly, and is highly collaborative. Um, we have adopted the same EDI neighborhoods that the HELP team has um, to take on this project. So the North Comox Valley is sort of our, our first area and we're in the third stage of our project with that. And the remaining three range, regions were in the first phase of the project. Um, if you could just flip to the next slide, please. 
So for um, our Building Connections project in the North Comox Valley, um, our definition reflects that of the, the HELP project in the EDI data as well. So it, catch, it includes the catchment areas of Cuban School Airport and Miracle Beach Elementary School. So you can imagine that's quite a diverse, um, large-ish area to be working with and spreads over into Dove Creek. So next slide, please. So the North, in this pro process, we've been at it for almost two years now. And um, the first stage of the project was to really understand the experiences that families and parents were having. And we've also um, engaged with service providers and stakeholders and community leaders to really have a good sense of what people are experiencing, the strengths within the community of the North Comox Valley, but also the barriers and, and some of the challenges people are facing. And through all of this, a lot, a lot of data and engagement, um, four main themes emerged, as you can see here, that really speak to the fact that parents are looking to connect within their neighborhoods, build community and, um, and find more support. So through those themes, a list of um, innovations was brought forth through the work of everyone involved. And the two that were really chosen to focus upon that we're working on moving forward now are to establish three um, hubs within the um, in North Comox Valley area and then create a family connection coordinator position to work both out of the hubs, but also to um, really foster and, and relationships with between families and to bridge families to service providers and, and really try to increase how families are access, being able to access services before they get to kindergarten when it's kind of a little bit late in the process to really encourage these, um, these, these connections earlier on. So I'm gonna hand it off to Joanne here. You can move it to the next slide. Thank you very much. And she's gonna take you forward as, as where we're at now and moving forward with the project. Thanks, Chris. It would be great to say, lovely to see you all, but with Zoom vision, I can only see about two of you. But um, anyways, it's uh, it's great to have this chance to uh, update you on the project. Um, so where we're at right now in terms of the North Comox Valley neighborhood, and just to kind of clarify, the neighborhoods at the Human Early Learning Partnership are really developed for statistical purposes. And for those of us who live here, we know that these are not really neighborhoods. And within each of our big EDI neighborhoods are a number of other smaller, what we, we actually know to be neighborhoods. But for the because we're monitoring the data in these geographic areas, we're keeping those neighborhoods intact. And so for the North Comox Valley planning, the next step is to really start to flesh out this idea of having community hubs, three of them, each in each one of the catchment areas of this uh, of this area, and um, and to hire a family connection coordinator position to really start to um, reach out to the community. One of the things that uh, is also integral to the social innovation approach is that it's the solutions are to be citizen driven. So many of us who are, you know, been around in the social service professions uh, for a lot of years find it difficult sometimes to step back and let parents and families lead the way. But we're finding with this project that that, that core component has really been critical. So uh, we are deep in now to the planning of where these hubs might be, what kinds of things will be in them, all, all of that. So it's uh, after, you know, 18 months to two years of data collection to actually be to this implementation stage is, is quite exciting. Oh, I pushed the button on a computer, but I can't advance the slide. So if you can go to the next one, thank you. Um, so as we start to implement in the north part of the valley, we will also and have started data collection in the other three areas. So South Comox Valley, Cumberland, uh, what's known as West Courtney, so west of the river, and then another area that's called Comox Valley View. So we'll be doing a very similar process in each of the three remaining neighborhoods and become and come up with particular citizen evolved innovations interventions for each of those neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Um, so why are we meeting with you today and what might be um, something that we are hoping we could do in partnership with you? Um, 
So really, and we're asking for participation in planning and implementation, but um, we've already had great participation um, from both directors and staff, particularly I want to thank Edwin and Arzina and Jennifer Zabinden, who have been closely connected to the work so far. We, you know, we have, we're really looking for places uh, in these areas where we can start to build the services and supports that families need uh, as hubs. Uh, and so, you know, really wanting to, to think about partnering in terms of accessing uh, facilities of the, of the regional dis district and to look at any potential for partnering in terms of uh, funding opportunities. For, so for an example, BC Healthy Communities has a, has a Plan H uh, opportunity for funding right now that has to be applied for by uh, First Nations or, or municipal bodies. Uh, and so there's opportunities like that where we can partner with the regional district to actually make these things a reality be fantastic. Um, so yeah, and then just as we move into the uh, newer into the new areas of the project, hoping that we'll be able to engage with the directors uh, for those areas or with the councillors from from Courtney and Comox um, to help us uh, moving forward. So I think that is it. I think you're next going to get a thank you or something. Oh yeah, just uh, this is all of the people that are involved. So it's a really strong partnership. Um, I'm providing the research support with uh, the Human Early Learning Partnership at UBC, and then we now have well, we have two staff. Ali Bruder is on mat leave, uh, but we have Chris who you've met, and then Darcy who is a parent in the Dove Creek area and has uh, we've managed to find a little bit of funding to begin to build her into a role of family outreach and, and further parent engagement. Now you're going to get the thank you at the last slide, I'm sure. <laughs> That's it. I don't know if we have time for questions. Yes, we would take questions. I think we have a hand up. Director Hamir. Thank you, Chair. And thanks to Joanne and Chris. That was a great presentation. And I'm really excited to see what comes out of this. Um, in my previous life, I was a community lead for um, Richmond Family Place. So I'm well um, versed in some of the EDI work. Um, so my question, though, is um, I'm a bit curious about what CVRD facilities you may be looking at. Um, if, have you yourselves um, highlighted some facilities? That's question one. And then question two is, um, have you had a look at our community halls in the different regions? Um, I can think of sort of in the Merville area of a couple of halls, but I'm still scratching my head for what what hub might where, what a hub might look like around airports. So I'm not quite sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just in a very beginning sense, have we started to identify some of those places? And yeah, you know, the Merville Hall, the Dove Creek Hall, those kinds of facilities have emerged as potential places. Uh, turns out the airport um, elementary is one of the few schools in the community that might have a little bit of space to partner with us. So uh, Chris and I have also met with the school board and began to plant some seeds with with that idea. So, um, but right now we're really just trying to identify where some of those places might be. Okay, and I'm assuming like in terms of partnership, there's not really a budget you're looking for in kind. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Director Grieve. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, uh, for the great work you guys are doing. Um, this has been, <laughs> It must be growing organically because it certainly is taking a sweet time coming about. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I have to agree with uh, Director Hamir that uh, unlike municipalities, the regional district doesn't own a lot of property. I mean, you can't really uh, uh, put a center in a, uh, a water pump station or something like that up at Oyster River. But uh, I know that uh, SC71 was quite involved early on on this discussion. And uh, they have a lot of property is superfluous to needs. Uh, they've closed a lot of schools. You probably know that Black Creek School was sold. And, and I guess north of the Oyster, the, the, the um, Oyster River uh, School was closed. And there's opportunities there. But I'm just wondering, uh, who was it? Alan Douglas, I think, was, was on, on, uh, on the team at one time. So just curious as to uh, what the conversation is going like with SD71. 
Well, I mean, I think it, we're off to a really good start with them, both Alan Douglas and then Jackie Anderson, who's their early learning lead for the district, have been really active on the steering committee. Um, you know, the school district is going through a, a big transformation right now as provincially all child care and early learning is about to come under the the umbrella of the school district. So there's a lot of things at play in terms of their facilities. Um, but I, I think at this point, it's just been good intentions to figure out how we can partner uh, with them where possible as well. So I don't know, Chris, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think it's, I think we're just in that, we're just kind of on the cusp, I think right now we're driving in and um, a, a sort of on Thursday, we're going to really meet to focus on the hub. So I think soon we'll have a sense, but we do have pretty good idea of where we can um, what might potentially work with this with the schools in the school district and um, and yeah and I, I think too understanding where the regional district like I, I know that you support certain halls but I know you don't actually operate them so yes. um, recognizing that and and how that would potentially if that ever came about what what those those options would look like so mm -hmm. and I think it's worth saying too that we're trying to not be sort of grandiose in our expectations around this. Like a hub doesn't have to be a big fancy building with a whole bunch of things in it. You know, in a, in a very, interestingly, lots of the data we collected from parents, particularly in that North Comox Valley area, talked about them wanting to be outside more and to take more advantage of our parks and beaches and all of the beauty we have around here. And so maybe to begin with, we're just gonna try to figure out where, is there a little piece of land where we can, um, you know, get a tent at least set up for those rainy days, but people can connect there. I mean, the the, the name of the project Building Connections is is such an in, important one to me. It really is about how do you find a place where people can come together. And so if, if it just starts out as something like that, as I said earlier, always being guided by the parents and the people who are gonna use the, the services, and we'll just see how it evolves in some ways. But we, we know we need to be a little bit humble on the, uh, on the capital front. <laughs> well, maybe Arzina and I can go down to Canada Tire and buy you a big tent or something like that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure I, speak, I speak for a director for Mary B as well in, in that we, we'll be behind you all the way and whatever we can do, let us know. Great, thanks, Edwin. As I say, Jennifer Zabinden, who's you know one of your lead staff around the um, the recreation and facilities side of things, is participating in the planning for this too. So she'll have a lot of insight. I think that will be helpful for us on the facility front. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Morin. Great, thank you, Chair, and thanks so much for that update. Uh, I haven't you know been following following things so much in the last little while with the collaborative. So it's great to hear. Um, I had a question. Could you refresh my memory on what the what all the the other hubs are in addition to the north? And then I have a couple questions. Sure. So there's four geographic chunks in that we're working with: the North Comox Valley. Then the second one is what's called South Comox Valley and Cumberland, which includes Fannie Bay, Union Bay, and the islands. Um, and then we have West Courtney. Um, when then we have Comox Valley View is one uh, chunk. So within that, as we do the process, the same thing will emerge as I think emerged in North Comox Valley. And that is that there'll be specific neighborhoods, uh, you know, within that. I mean, obviously the islands is gonna have a, you know, Hornby and Denman will have things that were separate to themselves as will Cumberland, et cetera, so. Right. Um... Yeah, I was actually thinking about parks when, when you were talking, um, because I think there's ways to utilize um, that outdoor space. And I know Jennifer has been doing a lot on the rec side with um, kind of looking at those opportunities and, and doing community partnerships. So um, Chair Arbor from the rec uh, commission can probably... Uh, keep his ears tuned on that, um, those kind of possibilities. Um, and just the, um, the mention of the funding partnership uh, opportunities, um, the one that you had mentioned, is there anything in the works for that? Or do you have suggestions on how to um, kind of formalize that sort of um, process with the 
RD? Yeah, I mean, we can certainly, um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple application uh, through BC Healthy Communities. And it would just be a matter of, and it fits right into some of the things that they're looking for, I think, this work. And so it would just be a matter of connecting with somebody uh, from the regional district and, you know, working together to put uh, a proposal um, back to the back to you and uh, back to the board and for approval I think I you know Chris you've probably looked at that more closely than I have but I don't think it's a very complicated one no it's it's pretty straightforward I did reach out to Jennifer just to see if it was something she wanted to speak with more and I, I believe she's away she's going to join us on Thursday for a meeting but she's out of the office right now so but I think we have till the beginning of June so hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that but sort of with the idea Initially, it could look different, but of maybe bringing some of that more of that outdoor um, aspect of what maybe the regional district can bring to to a to the hub in terms of activities or engagement for families. So we'll, we'll explore that further for sure. Right, and of course, we always have to look at the the staff capacity. But I think um, these opportunities, if uh, if the partnering organization can do a lot of the work, uh, <laughs> yeah, especially if it's a more simple process you know that that's I think the, the board is always welcome um, welcome to those partnerships so thanks so much thanks Wendy okay I think we have director Hamir with follow-up yes thanks for allowing me a second question second time around um, my question is actually to staff uh, I'm wondering like we've just gone through the, our um, rural communities um, granting process and so part of that um, process was again you know thinking back to our um, rural halls um, potential service that we're having and I'm wondering if staff do have capacity to work with um, with this collaborative to identify halls that might have capacity. Is that something that staff, um, I mean, if you could just comment on, on what capacity is like right now. Thank you very much, uh, Director and Chair. I'll just uh, refer this matter just to uh, Doug DeMarzo. Um, Doug oversees Jennifer in the recreation program as well as the lead with respect to our uh, community hall network. Uh, thank you, Russell. At uh, this time, yeah, I think we do have some capacity. We have Jennifer already working with this group, and we may be able to bring on uh, additional support with one of our programmers, uh, given the aquatic centers closed. So I encourage the group to reach out to Jennifer and myself and have that discussion with us. And that may be able to coordinate some more conversation around community halls, as well as other space potential. Great, thank you. Right, that sounds fantastic. Doesn't sound like a motion or anything's required, so. Okay, great. I don't see any hands up. So thank you so much to Joanne and Chris for the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye, take care. Have a good evening. Okay, and we're on receipt. Is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carry it. And we're on to the next delegation regarding the sewer system conveyance project. And the presenter is Eduardo Urenga. We have a seat. Second. Director Hamir and McCollum, thank you. Welcome, Eduardo, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, well, just starting by showing this um, initial slide, um, I'm exploiting my relationship with Rural Masters because my intention is sincere and is based on the fact that I've been living in the valleys for about 30 years and I witnessed the destruction that was caused by um, having that pipe going on as a, you know, around the bluffs and destroying the beach. And now um, the story seems to be repeating again. Um, and, and I must say that $73 million uh, is excessive. And it, it's um, a point I'm trying to make is why put money into something that is 39 years old? I don't have anything in my house that is 20 years old. I don't know how many people actually keep things that are that old. Uh, the technology is old. And why are we putting money into something that um, is you know, no, what, not going to last for very much longer. Now the premise um, that was used 
to reject the option of um, putting a new plant in was um, because it was too expensive. Unfortunately, uh, that is not something that we can afford to do anymore because uh, the cost of uh, um, something like that should not be the only thing that it, it's um, taking um, consideration. Um, my belief is that the uh, water treatment plant must be replaced with a facility that needs to be energy efficient and has, would have a, a zero, if not minimal, carbon footprint, according to what we have determined in our official community plan. Next. Interesting enough, um, it was very difficult to actually do this presentation to you um, in the beginning when I tried to participate in, in the regular process, I was denied the option to obtain all the information to, to actually gain access to um, a more informed uh, position. So I had to do a lot of research on my own. Um, and I'm not gonna call it a concern, it's more an objection uh, the lack of documentation in the process that was used to reject the construction of a new plan um, was never there. And um, it was just proceeding without the proper scrutiny on why the, that option was rejected. I tried and I was rejected several times by the security staff. And all of a sudden the decision was taken um, right after well, two weeks after I had the opportunity to talk to them. Um, it is interesting that, um, you know, the decision was handed down to a company that sells pipelines. Um, the company, I was told, has a lot of experience building um, sewer plants. And the only one that I have found was the one in Ladysmith. And that one was subcontracted to another company. And obviously that's something that um, is kind of interesting that for them was $18 million for a plant that is about half the size of what we need here. And all of a sudden that number is $173 million. Next. I must point out that um, um, Mr. Dyson has agreed to provide all the information that would help me make a, a much better assessment of the situation. And I'm waiting for that still. Um, I believe that we are now facing an era of consequences. Everything we do today is gonna have very, very bad or good consequences depending on how we go at it. Um, the monetary cost of the water treatment plant should not be the only criteria for re rejection. Environmental consequences need to be of much higher priority than they are given right now. Um, also, it is important to address the fact that we are an agricultural community and um, water is scarce. And most people would not believe that it's possible, but I have been in contact and immersed in the agriculture community and water is very, very difficult to come by in the middle of the summer. Next. Um, the liquid waste management process must be a sustainable solution in tune with the foreseeable needs of the next generation. That's basic concept of sustainability. But also um, we can address the, the, the situation with reasonable environmental and financial costs. Next. My big question is, is this really necessary to disrupt the life of the people in Comox so much for something that is not truly needed. Next. Another thing that hits me pretty hard is uh, the recovering resources. It's a mandate by the province and it's being played down um, um, substantially by the, the people involved in the process of evaluation of this. Uh, the reclaimed water uh, they claim that it would be very difficult and they would need a pipe to move the water. We need to move the pipe anyway. We need, but, sorry, we need to move the water anyway. We'll get building a pipeline. So why not use something similar to move the water towards the agriculture situation instead of just dumping it in the ocean? 
the heat recovery option was rejected because there's nobody nearby. But there's plenty of places on the way that the water from the sewer plant, the sewer, uh, the sewage could be used for heat recovery, even at the Comox um, band area where they can use the, the heat to feed their community. Um, the, the other um, beneficial use of treated solids. Well, um, it is something that is not being addressed properly. The amount of organic matter coming out of that plant is 3,300 cubic meters per month that need to be trucked out over to Cumberland. And th those could be processed right at the plant. And they say that the production of biogas is not sufficient to justify that, if, that situation. Well, that may be because the plant uses an excessive amount of energy because most of the plants that are built today are self-sufficient because of the processing of the biosolids to, to uh, create that energy that it needs. Also, that is kind of ridiculous to think that in agriculture community where we put a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in the ground, a fertilizer, and we take it out of the water and then dump it in the ocean. That's a contradiction in terms. So I believe that that is something that needs to be addressed properly. Next. We have an issue that 30% um, of the sewage water comes from toilets. As an example, I'm using a toilet that I was appalled to see, like old and uh, patched, and there is a sign that says, please hold the handle until the, the toilet flushes. And it's sitting at the Royal DePage office in Courtney. It's like, why do we allow situations like that? This is an example of a very, very low hanging fruit that we, we reduce the demand of wastewater treatment. Toilet replacement should be heavily subsidized and mandatory. Just as an example, uh, just looking at Home Depot site, there's a perfectly nice toilet. You can see the picture to the right. 12,000 households in Courtney, the total investment will be $2.1 million to give each house one toilet. The water saved will be 2,800 cubic meters per day. The, the cost of plant reduction for the size of the plant that you don't need will be 4.1 million. That's almost double of, of the investment that you have to just replace in the toilet. So the cost of a plant goes, in this case, I'm ahead of the game because a plant that we need will cost about $26 million. Next. So I'm here really- Eduardo, just to let you know, there's, there's a number of slides left, but you um, only have one minute left. Okay, uh, that's what I was supposed to request because this is a very um, complex decision to be made. So if we can go to, um, you know, I don't know how to explain that the time is not enough to address such a complex issue. Um, if we go to um, make, make a couple uh, uh, slides further. Uh, for instance, this one, this, um, this slide is, is, is taken out of the report given by the staff to the, um, the, 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 the sewer commission and it contradicts itself because most of the stuff that is being um, addressed in that report is not being taken into consideration. Next. Um, this is something that should be addressed. There is uh, a lot of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that are not being taken seriously in those reports. Next. Go ahead, keep going. The current approach is business as usual. I think we need to uh, figure out how to do it without doing things the way we're doing it today because it's obviously not working. Um, okay, so I'm obviously past my time. I don't have enough time to continue. Uh, but I, I would like to address the issue that uh, the cost of the plant is not even close to twice or three times as they say. The cost of a plant, a brand new plant will be about $25 million. And I have the documentation and all the research done to justify that statement. 
I guess I'm going to have to finish because there's no much time that I can. Yes, that, that's the time. Um, are you open to questions? Eduardo? Yeah, sure. I'm up for questions. If, if there are any okay, yep. questions. Director Hamir? Thanks, Chair. Um, actually, my question was more, I guess, for staff to, to just um, maybe respond to some of the comments that um, Ms. Mr. Uranga's made um, regarding the life, uh, the lifespan of the, the sewage treatment plant. Um, my understanding is there's quite a lot of life left and that that was one of the reasons why the um, liquid waste management plan and the TAC pack chose that decision. So could you just, I don't know if you have um, those numbers beside you of how, how much um, space and, and room for expansion that we have, um, if you've got a lifespan on that, um, on our, our treatment facility. Madam Chair, to answer the director's question, I think Chris LaRose is on the line, would probably have that in hand. And uh, I'll ask Chris to respond to that question. Sure, thanks. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, so yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, uh, Director Hamir. The facility, of, uh, first of all, a facility of this type is built, um, you know, is an extremely expensive proposition. It was an extremely expensive proposition in the late 70s and early 80s when this was being planned and built. Uh, so a facility of this type, because of its cost um, and the effort required to build it, these, these facilities are built you know, for, for a, a, as long of a lifespan as possible. Um, so the infrastructure that was built in the early 80s um, you know, could have, uh, you know, to be expected to have a 80 plus uh, year lifespan. Um, so that's the you know the tankage, uh, and the and the and the buildings. Um, the pumps are replaced you know on a, on a more frequent basis. You know, um, say on the on the order of twenty to tw fifteen to twenty five years, depending on the on the on the equipment. Um, but the the bones of the facility, the tankage, which is the, the the most significant cost, is is built to to be eighty plus years. It wouldn't be unexpected to to reach a hundred years. Uh, so when they selected that property, they chose a property that was large enough to accommodate the significant growth expected in the community. So, you know, fast forward 40 years, um, and you know, the recent work we've done over the last few years indicates that. Um, so sorry, when they first built the plant, they they they, they selected a site that was large enough um, for a full mirroring or doubling of the plant capacity. Um, our, our more recent study work has confirmed that approach. Um, and so it's very likely that's that's how that that, uh, that the facility will be expanded. Uh, we do plan a, a site master plan process this year, um, but but that's really just looking at you know exactly how we should go about those expansions. There's no question that that facility and that site can accommodate um, the growth in the community projected out beyond 80 years from now, um, which would be a total of 120 years. Uh, sorry. Yeah, 120 years from from when the plant was built. So, so no concerns about capacity um, or the ability of that site or the facility to accommodate the growth in the community. Great, thanks. Thanks for confirming that because I knew the numbers were high. And you know, just as an environmentalist myself, I think the you know the best option is always to use and, and make the the best use of what infrastructure is, is there rather than trying to plan for obsolescence, which I think, I guess we're kind of used to in our society, which is maybe why the comment about, you know, things not lasting 20 years. Um, I'm really glad that, you know, fo folks back in the eighties were thinking such so long-term. Um, and, you know, I can confirm being on the TAC pack that this was one of the reasons why the TAC pack chose um, the option of not building a second plant or a new plant because all the infrastructure was there and it just made more environmental sense to use the, that facility and um, upgrade where needed. So um, thanks, thanks for confirming that. Thank you. Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Eduardo for the presentation. And um, I understand that uh, staff have uh, made a commitment to uh, respond uh, directly uh, to the concerns that have been raised. Uh, and perhaps uh, Mr. Dyson could just uh, confirm that, please. 
Um, Madam Chair, yes, to respond to uh, Director Hillian's uh, question, staff will respond to the many questions that uh, Mr. Naranga has raised with us. We weren't able to com complete that in time for this presentation, but uh, he will be provided a, a, a response. I also make the commitment to share that with the Sewage Commission as well, the response to Mr. Naranga's uh, uh, questions of us. And I just want to thank him very much for continuing to question us and, and ask these things and put forward these ideas we do, we do take very seriously. Thank you. And um, I just want to acknowledge uh, that it's a significant amount of work for staff, but um, serious questions have been raised about uh, the integrity of the project and the process. And uh, I think it's uh, totally appropriate that, um, that staff respond in the manner considered. So thanks very much. Thank you. And Dr. Grieve. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Eduardo. I think uh, all things considered, Eduardo's actually bang on the money in a lot of these, these uh, uh, points he's raised. I think if we were starting from scratch, uh, we would definitely be using uh, integrated resource management principles. We'd definitely be uh, doing it a, a far different way than we're doing it today. But as Director Hamir has raised the point that we're already down this path and to change horses now is just not even conceivable. But my question to staff is some of these points about you know, utilizing biosolids, uh, utilizing uh, uh, dewatering uh, systems to, uh, to recycle the water for its agriculture, recreation, golf courses or whatever, I mean, uh, are we keeping that in, in our focus as we move ahead in the long term? Because I would think that that would be the way to uh, gradually shift it away from uh, just the big pipe into the ocean. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, to respond to the director's question, the uh, liquid waste management plan, a thorough, extensive process that uh, involved the community, uh, professionals, and otherwise looking at all the aspects had three components to it. One was conveyance, the other was treatment, and the third was resource recovery. So all topics that were considered by uh, the liquid waste management plan and are advising the sewage commission moving forward. And as directors are aware, the regional district uh, produces Skyrocket, uh, a product that is uh, made from our biosolids and is available for landscaping and other purposes. And, um, and that, that we continue to look at ways and means of upgrading our, our, our ways in which we develop these products and we make them available to the public and are working with our partners, the municipalities to provide that as an alternative to, to other systems and, and processes. Thank you. Eduardo, do you have any final comment? Well, the thing is that trying to defend something that is already on the way I don't think that's, it's, we are going towards, um, you know, the others, we should stop walking. Um, the, the sewer treatment facility that as it is today is obsolete as technology is speaking. And also the resource recovery is a fact of life and it should happen now, not but in the future. And um, the, the, the carbon footprint of the project is immense not only the embedded carbon of the materials used, also the construction and the, the long-term use of energy is horrendous. We're talking more than 1 million kilowatt hours a year just to pump. Nobody pumps uphill that kind of water. So it's really difficult to understand why is it that we have to stick, stick to something that was decided 40 years ago. We have the opportunity and the intention to be better. Why not do it? Thank you. Thank you so much and thanks for all the effort that you put in and um, all the very good questions, uh, both email and in your presentation today. And uh, staff are committed to getting back to you and also sharing those answers with the Sewage Commission. Thank you. Thank you. So we are on receipt. Anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none that is carried. And we're on to reports. And the first report is the Regional District of Nanaimo Regional Growth Strategy Amendment for Nanaimo Airport Lands. Move it. Second. Grieve and McCollum, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Robin Home, our rural planner, is on on the line. I think I got that title wrong, but uh, Robin Home is here to speak to this and uh, answer any of your questions. Thank you, Robin. 
through the chair and to the directors, good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to bring forward a referral from the Regional District of Nanaimo. The RDN is in the process of amending the RGS and they have sent a request to the CVRD board to provide a resolution um, to accept the proposed amendment. We received this amendment in March in the form of a referral and this is uh, attached as a Appendix A. Um, this is uh, the process for a standard RGS amendment and uh, according to section 436 of the local government act um, an affected local government is to accept an amendment by law within 60 days of the receipt of referral and as mentioned this is uh, for the standard RGS amendment process after review by staff it's been determined that the amendment is um, just to adjust uh, boundaries to acknowledge the current land use, um, airport land use, to align with the Nanaimo um, uh, airport land use plan and to essentially support the complementary uh, um, commercial uses um, of the Nanaimo airport. Although the subject lands are not in the ALR, there is a restricted covenant in place between the ALC and the Nanaimo Airport um, Authority restricting the land uses to airport related activities only. The ALC has been referred in, um, they've been included in, in the referral process, including the OCP and the zoning bylaw amendments um, that have been undertaken in 2020 in preparation for this RGS amendment. Um, they have also been referred uh, on this amendment as well. And as there are no implications to the CVRD, um, the policies, uh, are the RGS and the OCP, staff recommend that the board pass a resolution to accept uh, the bylaw um, number 1615042020 and forward the resolution to the RDN chair. Great. Thank you, Robin. Are there any questions? No, I don't see any. So we're on receipt and it's a vote of the full board. Anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And there is a recommendation. Moved. Second. Okay, Morin and Swift, thank you. Any further discussion? Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Thanks, Robin. So we're on to item two, strengthening community services grant opportunity. Move receipt. Second. Hillian and Hamir, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Robin Home, our long range planner, is on the line to present this report and she will be supported by Andrea Capelli as well. Through the chair and to the directors, I'm here again to present um, an exciting grant opportunity. In February, the province announced the new Strengthening Community Services Fund as part of the Safe Restart Agreement. This funding program is to support the unsheltered and homeless populations and to address the related community impacts since the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic started last year. UBCM will be administering this grant on behalf of the province. Applications are due April 16th and uh, um, approvals are expected later this spring. Staff recommend that we submit a regional application um, in order to address the increased demand in services that have been experienced um, have been experienced throughout our community. And as well, this helps to demonstrate to the grant funders cost effectiveness and efficiencies in providing support services at a regional scale. Based on the um, program population threshold for maximum uh, funding, a regional application involving all three electoral areas and the municipalities would make our application eligible to apply for $1.25 million. 
staff recommend that we apply for the full amount and similar to other grant funded projects with community partners, the CVRD would serve as the primary applicant and the fiscal host supporting the coalition to end homelessness and other key partners to deliver the proposed key um, activities. Using the homelessness support service function 451, the CVRD would be able to administer the grant funds and supporting uh, the coalition uh, to end homelessness and the other key partners to carry out the key activities. This project would help advance some of the recommendations from the, the recently completed housing needs report, as well as supporting the board's strategic drivers, fiscal responsibility and community partnerships. Staff recommend that the board authorize staff to make the, the regional application to UBCM for the full amount up to $1.25 million and for the CVRD to send a request to each partnering municipality um, recognizing the CVRD as the primary applicant to apply for, receive, and manage the grant on their behalf. I would now like to turn it over to Andrea Capelli from the Coalition and Homelessness who will be presenting on the proposed scope of activities and the budget. Thank you so much, Robin, and thanks to you all for having me here this night. Um, I really just want to emphasize that we are on the brink of a major opportunity for our, our regional district. It's not very often we are able to apply for funding at this level for vulnerable populations. So I, I personally feel that it's something that we should very seriously consider. So the scope of the project that, that we've proposed is it's really multifaceted. Um, and I'll break it down uh, just in little brief chunks as to what it is. But really what we're looking for is uh, first of all to expand capacity of so the day program that's offering supports for folks experiencing homelessness um, and then also to meet the increased demand for overnight shelter in our community to be able to provide uh, an additional overnight shelter in addition to Pidcock shelter uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, this grant is a one year grant and it is really meant to sort of, uh, you know, bridge the extra needs that vulnerable populations have during the pandemic. And we've certainly, uh, since opening Connect as a temporary shelter, uh, which is set to uh, end on April 15th, have been, you know, turning folks away. And Pidcock, uh, the, the MAP program for men has been um, at capacity or near capacity every evening. So there's a lot of folks that were not able to serve even with the, the additional um, shelter that was temporarily open. So that, that kind of acted as a bit of a pilot project and an experiment to see if we had two shelter spaces, would they be utilized? And, and the answer to that is yes. So that's um, one part of the grant is to provide yeah the additional capacity for Connect and additional um, uh, shelter throughout the pandemic. And again, this is also uh, part, uh, it reflects on the housing proposal that the regional district and all uh, three municipalities endorsed um, that we had submitted to BC Housing and, and the powers that be back in, in January. So the other piece of the grant is really around extending outreach services, and that's to um, really be able to access folks who are living in the rural areas, including Denman and, and Hornby. Uh, we know folks are really isolated out there, particularly during the pandemic. And so we want to connect them to outreach workers, resources, and, you know, provide outreach van transportation or whatever is needed to, to get them the help that they need. Um, and then also that additional outreach would be able to, uh, you know, take care of any increased needs that, that are happening within the, the rest of the, the region as well. And in addition to that, there is a, a big piece that was brought forward through uh, City of Courtney staff, which is to uh, increase funds uh, for bylaw cleanup initiatives. So, um, you know, cleaning up abandoned campsites and, and just covering the costs, the additional costs that that's put on municipal budgets. And that's, again, for all the region and all the municipalities would, would be receiving funds for that. Um, and then there's a big 
a big piece of this also is, you know, wherever we have connect or an emergency shelter, we need to be doing increased community engagement and neighborhood engagement and business engagement. So a large part of this grant would allow for the coalition to be able to really do a, uh, a designated project or forums or whatever is needed to make sure that, you know, we're breaking stigma, we're increasing community awareness of what's going on and that we're bridging uh, gaps and communication and, and building partnerships, which, as we all know, is really, really key to, to success. And then finally, the other piece of this is uh, to be able to provide training opportunities for municipal staff. So for bylaw, for park staff, for public work staff, for recreation staff, um, basically anyone who is, you know, essentially on the front lines of, of homelessness, you know, where, where folks are interacting with, with people on a daily basis. And so this would be things like cultural competency, uh, anti-stigma training, you know, mental health de crisis de-escalation, um, any, any of those trainings. And those trainings would also be open to nonprofit staff as well as volunteers. So that kind of puts us all on the same uh, page in the way that we're, we're working together. So really it's um, Connect kind of acting as like the, the hub, the center, and then these spokes of activities uh, branching off from that. And so we've uh, we've gone through our budget and we're able to <laughs> maximize that 1.25 million. And I think we're sitting at a 1.21 million uh, dollar application. And as we know, the the cost to operate uh, connector shelter it's it's quite high. You need a lot of of staff and and supports for that. So I really just wanted to, you know, give a shout out to the regional district staff and city of Courtney staff and, and all of the folks that we've been working with. Uh, we've been meeting, you know, weekly over the last month or four to six weeks or so, um, just really, you know, highlighting what needs were from a municipal standpoint, as well as from a, a community organization standpoint. And I was really pleased to see that you know, our needs really dovetailed nicely together and we're able to build this really encompassing um, grant application. So that's great. And then we also have letters of support from Island Health, um, Public Health and uh, First Nations Health Authority, I believe is signing on, Watch a Friendship Center and the coalition will write a letter of support as well. So we're, we're in a really good, uh, we're in a really good place with that. So the other piece I just wanted to point out is, you know, being able to have this opportunity for funding, it almost offers us a bit of a, I don't want to say a respite, but an opportunity to sort of breathe a little bit um, instead of scrambling for continued emergency funding throughout the pandemic for this population. If we're able to secure that funding and able to provide some services, it allows for us to do more of the advocacy work on what's really needed, which is more supportive housing more recovery, you know, all the things that are missing in the community. So I just really, again, I'm emphasizing the fact that this is an opportunity that does not come across our inboxes very often and, and just wanted to sort of cover what we were hoping to, to do. So with that, I will um, give it back to Robin and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks so much. Yeah, that would be amazing to be able to provide that level of support to our vulnerable populations. Um, we have a couple questions. Um, Dr. Morin. Oh, great. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks so much for that, uh, that report. Very exciting. Um, I, uh, you know, I know that, I know we're not at the recommendation yet, but, um, and I know you've been in contact with staff at the municipalities, um, about this, but it talks about the resolution um, asking councils to provide a resolution to basically um, allow the RD to be the primary applicant, et cetera. I thought I heard that the deadline is April 16th, did you say? What's the deadline for the application? Uh, May 7th. Oh, May 7th. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry, it is April 16th. Okay, it is April 16th. So that's one thing I, I wondered about how, how that was all going to fall into place. Um, 
I can and, speak to that. Um, okay, and then I have one other question. Okay. Um, well, uh, first, I'll just address this question. Uh, it, with UBCM, they uh, allow resolutions to come in after application deadlines, understanding the way that local governments work, that sometimes it takes um, with the process with, with council and with board, that there would be a, a bit of a, a lag when it comes to receiving that that support and so is our intention to reach out to the municipalities and then if um if the council resolutions do come forward we would be then uh, submitting those to ubcm but we would be communicating beforehand that the resolutions would be coming right it's, it's typically how we've dealt with these regional applications in the past right thank you for that clarification um and then the other the other thing i just wanted to mention is um andrea you had you had said that you know, this may allow a little bit of breathing room for you, et cetera, um, during this period. And I, I would suspect that as often is the case, um, you know, looking longer term or, you know, into the future um, to, to hopefully secure this kind of, um, these kind of supports going forward um, to really gain some traction. One of the things that funders often love is, is having some pilot or some evidence um, to present. Uh, so I would say that this would, would probably satisfy that as well to, to show that the need is here and to show some of the outcomes, et cetera. Would that be accurate? Thanks. Yes, I absolutely think that's accurate. And a big part of this grant is actually showing we've already had to work out all of the metrics of, you know, how we would be tracking all of these different initiatives and also talking about sort of what the wrap up plan would be, which, of course, for us would be to encourage uh, for some some permanent uh, spaces. But yeah, if, if, if we're successful in this grant application, even putting it forward shows that there's a need here. And it shows that, you know, regionally, we're all working together on this. And I think it does sort of raise some, uh, some interest. And, and I believe, you know, just in experiences we've been having lately, that's really what's needed is some focus and attention to the regional district and, and the impacts uh, that, you know, the, the pandemic's been having on vulnerable folks here. So it's, again, opportunity is my favorite word of the day today. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's, it's really exciting and, uh, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll have some success if this goes through, thanks. Thank you. And just to add that uh, we were on a call earlier today where uh, Tara Faganella from the ministry had said that uh, decision would be made by this summer on this funding stream. Uh, Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair. And uh, thanks to staff and to Andrea for putting together this um, this uh, application. I, when I saw the amount, I was I was a little bit floored. So I'm really happy to see like how well um, you know, you've really fleshed out the application. So thank kudos to all of you who put all the time and energy into this. Um, and I, I loved all of the different spokes as you were talking about, um, all of the things that were going to be involved. Um, I think it's, they're all, you know, much needed. And um, I'm particularly interested in the building capacity with the training for um, staff, for front frontline folks who may not get that this type of training. Like, you know, our park staff, I think, have, have to deal with um, the homelessness um, community and, and maybe don't have the cultural competency kind of training that maybe um, nonprofit groups get. So thank you for including them. Um, I just wanted to make a point because... Um, Yesterday at electoral areas, we did have the RCMP, um, like Inspector Curvers speak about um, the homelessness community in, in the Comox Valley. And I, I felt a bit of a hesitancy there around the training around, um, I guess, mental health issues. And I'm wondering if this capacity building would also be open to the RCMP or if that's because they're a federal agency, if they're above and beyond what UBCM funds. I mean, even I, if that's saying that they'd be open to it, but if, mm -hmm. if they were, yeah. I think we, we did end up having that conversation and I, I felt like at the time it was, we, we, we were under the impression that there were some of those trainings happening at the RCMP level, but I, I also watched the meeting yesterday and I, I, 
I personally don't see why we wouldn't want to open it up to those who would be interested. Um, it's if we can, all, like I said, if we can all be on the same playing field, I, I really don't have, there's no parameters within the grant that says it's, you know, specifically has to be municipal staff. So yeah. Okay, great. Thank Opportunity you. again. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you again. Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to the presenters. Um, yeah, this is an amazing opportunity. Um, I just wanted to um, let uh, board members know that um, um, it's my understanding that uh, there are some challenges uh, with uh, convincing uh, BC Housing of the need for uh, more shelter beds in the community. And um, along with um, the, um, the key issue, in my view, which is uh, uh, long-term housing, um, Andrea did make reference to the letter that uh, we all joined uh, forces to send uh, to the province. Um, I'm bringing a resolution to Courtney Council uh, next Monday requesting a, a meeting with Minister Eby as a follow-up to that uh, letter um, and just to, to press the case uh, for these services that, uh, um, that we so desperately need. Um, and uh, it may be an opportunity if we get the, the requested meeting to, to put in a good word on this grant application as well, which I think is certainly a, a step in the right direction to give uh, the agencies, uh, people like Andrea and her colleagues who are doing this work, uh, to give them the additional resources. And so many people are doing this off the side of their desk um, and uh, a more comprehensive approach I think is, is certainly warranted. We're bearing the brunt of these issues on a daily basis uh, in the impact on our business community and other residents uh, who live nearby and uh, who go to work uh, and deal with some of the challenges. And of course, in the, the, the dreadful uh, impact on health and uh, other outcomes for the people who are afflicted with uh, the lack of housing and the related issues that we're also aware of. So thanks very much for uh, bringing this initiative forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, and it was nice to hear that there was the other letters of support that Andrea had mentioned um, to um, go along with this application as well. All right, I don't see any further hands. We're still on receipt. It's a vote of the areas, Courtney and Cumberland. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. Move the recommendation. Second it. Okay. Hillian and Greaves, thank you. Any further discussion? Again, it's the vote of the areas, Courtney Cumberland. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that passes unanimously. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, <laughs> okay, so we move on to bylaws and resolutions. And the first one is for adoption. Bylaw number 651, the Comox Valley Emergency Program. Move 651 for adoption. Second. Second. Grieve and Swift, thank you. And it's both the full board. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. And we're on to item two, which is bylaw number 652 for adoption. Move adoption. Second. Hamir and Grieve, thank you. The municipal ticket information bylaw. It's a vote of the areas. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried and we're on to new business. The first item is the request for support of resolution at UBCM. And I will pass it on to Director Hamir once I get a first and second. I'll move correspondence. Second. Sec Grieve and McCollum, thank you. And Director Hamir, would you like to speak to the resolution? I would, thank you. Um, so I was approached by the Comox Valley um, Youth Climate Coalition who asked um, that this letter be forwarded to the, the regional district to support a resolution that um, the city of Nanaimo um, forwarded to UBCM. 
Um, so I just want to um, convey that uh, this is something that our, our youth and our community have asked us to support. Um, I think it falls very much in line with our, um, our lenses and our pillars around climate action and around supporting our community connections. Um, obviously, we are asking for support of a resolution that's already gone going forward. Um, and uh, basically, it's asking, and I know this is a controversial issue around forestry, but uh, what the resolution is asking for is um, for deferred logging until um, such time that all of the parties can come to the table. Um, some of you may know that there was an old growth um, panel that was put together uh, by, the, by the province um, and who published a, a series of recommendations in 2020. And many of these recommendations actually have not been actioned. So the, the call for a deferral until the, those, those um, recommendations can be actioned, I think is, is very sound. So um, what, uh, what the, the correspondence is ask, asking for is um, when this item does come to vote at, at UBCM that you keep in mind that the youth of our community is asking for your support for this particular resolution. And happy to take any questions if, if there are any. Great, thanks so much, Director Muir. And thank you for bringing this forward. Director Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. I forwarded some uh, communication today from uh, ABICC, from Liz Cookson. Uh, I was trying to figure out when this last came before UBCM. And it was actually not supported by UBCM because they said it was too local an issue. It should just be an ABICC issue. But I was, I think, second vice president at the time. And uh, I... I ended up meeting with Minister uh, uh, Thompson, Steve Thompson, who was Minister of Flynn Road at the time. And um, we brought forward the, the concept uh, that, uh, you know, we're down to, what is it, 1.7% or what have you of old growth left on Vancouver Island. And uh, uh, the minister, you know, kept talking about managing this resource. Well, it's ludicrous because it's not a resource. We used to have pockets of old growth forests in the Comox Valley. In fact, where I grew up, we had uh, some cedar trees and, and Douglas fir and spruce trees were old growth on the farm I grew up on. And my dad, when he sold the farm, uh, got a promise from the, the buyer that he wouldn't log it. Of course, as soon as he was gone, he logged it. We had old growth forest uh, in many places. Now I think that the last remaining of these, these giants are down at Kitty Coleman Park. So it, it's not a resource. It's just not a resource. But it doesn't seem to matter which provincial government is, is in office. They seem to roll over on these issues all the time. And their eyes glaze over. I guess I guess the, the money is, is just too great. Um, I mean, I can tell you as well, I mean, you're gonna say, here goes Uncle Eddie again, but I can tell you working in the Gold River pulp mill, we used to take logs that were six feet thick and chip them up to make pulp to sell to China and Japan. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's gone beyond that now. It should be a total moratorium. We're living in the past. This is it. What do you think? How long does it take to grow a 500 year old tree? Okay, so I'm in total support. I don't know if we're going to get anywhere with the province. As I say, their eyes seem to glaze over when it comes right down to the crux of things. They talk the talk, but when it comes right down to it, they always roll over. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to start by saying that thank you to the Comox Youth Climate Council uh, for their advocacy and to uh, Director Amir for bringing this to the board. And uh, there was a letter that the CBRD wrote uh, in January of 2020 to the Old Growth Strategic Review Panel. And after reviewing that, I can see that this resolution is really remarkably aligned with what we've already said to the province about how we feel about uh, the value of old growth. And I'm just going to quote, it was a letter by Chris LaRose, and uh, there were a couple of paragraphs that I thought really stood out. One was that the value of old growth forests cannot be overstated. 
They're critical for wildlife habitat, stabilization of headwater streams and water flows, serve as a genetic bank, uh, and serve as an ecological library of knowledge for current and future generations of researchers, and land managers. And uh, the letter <clears throat> eventually concludes by saying all first growth areas should be protected in perpetuity uh, without consideration of what percentage of the land base they represent. Um, and they must be permanently and completely protected. So I, I see this resolution really as affirming a position that we've already taken with the, um, with the provincial government and reinforcing our belief in that. And I just also wanted to mention, I thought two things that were particularly important about the resolution. One is that uh, um, the resolution acknowledges that moves to protect old growth must be paired with efforts to ensure a just transition for workers and communities, both indigenous and non-indigenous that currently rely upon logging of old growth. And it also states that uh, any work must be, uh, or any agreements must, must be conducted in the full spirit of reconciliation. So uh, as, as um, Vice Chair Hamir was saying, it, um, it aligns with our strategic pillars of, uh, of climate change and working with our community partners. And it also seems to align quite clearly with the, uh, the submission we've already made to the old growth review panel. So, for those reasons, I'll, I'll be supporting this, uh, this resolution to UBCM. Thanks. Thank you, Director Hamir. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to thank both uh, Directors Grieve and Cole Hamilton for their passionate um, responses, and it's very heartening. Um, but I just wanted to confirm too with staff, because my understanding was initially it was going to ask that we forward this resolution to UBCM. But I understand there were so many su similar submissions that we were actually told not to, um, but just to, and, and so I believe it is already going to be debated at UBCM. And I'm just hoping to um, Director Greaves' comments that there's now enough support. I mean, we've just lost so much of our old growth that um, it's the, the time has come. Um, so just could I confirm with staff that they, they um, that this was the communication that they got from UBCM? Madam Chair, I'll just refer this to Jake Martinson. He can clarify. Thanks, Russell. And through the Chair, uh, yes, we did have a quick conversation with UBM, UBCM staff, and they did confirm that at least three uh, such resolutions have been received already, and they were expecting more. Uh, only one will be accepted for a debate, so uh, no further resolutions are required to be submitted, in their opinion. Uh, but just uh, as uh, you've alluded to, support from the directors on the floor is, is would be in order. Thanks for confirming. Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I just want to uh, acknowledge um, some of the complexities involved here while um, wholeheartedly agreeing with uh, what my colleagues have already stated. Um, first of all, uh, there's, a, I think, a fairly uh, uh, complex system of land tenure in place. Um, and that's why the, the company involved, for example, in the Ferry Creek area right now is able to get an injunction. So that's a complication that has to be worked through. Secondly, there's uh, indigenous rights at stake. And uh, we've just had a declaration, uh, I believe yesterday from the Pachidat uh, First Nation, rejecting the involvement of uh, protesters and such and uh, indicating that, uh, that it's their jurisdiction to manage uh, these, uh, uh, this particular old growth forest um, and uh, to make use of it uh, uh, in terms of both conservation, cultural uh, and economic uh, uh, purposes as uh, they believe they have um, for generations. So that's another significant complication. Um, if, if we're to believe uh, the interview uh, with the Premier, the comments made by the Premier uh, on CBC earlier this week, um, or, or last week perhaps, um, there is work going on to try and resolve these issues. Um, and I think more to the point than a UBCM resolution, of which it sounds like there are all sorts, uh, it might be a, a, an actual resolution uh, by the board and a letter to the Premier um, based uh, on uh, some of these, uh, um, some of the wording that we've got uh, as advocated by the, um, the local uh, Youth Climate Caucus. Uh, uh, I think direct communication uh, with the province uh, to give the views of, uh, of the communities we represent uh, would uh, be more significant than uh, 
simply jumping on a UBCM uh, resolution at this point. So I'm not quite sure why we wouldn't uh, take that path forward. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we discussed this at Cumberland Council uh, last night as well. Um, uh, we had the same letter from the Comox Youth Council and uh, there we talked about how um, this was discussed a couple of years ago um, at AVICC. It was uh, the resolution was brought forward, brought forward by Victoria and um, long lines formed at both the pro and con mic and uh, the result was they ended up pulling the resolution because it was too contentious and uh, and it is contentious, and I think that's why we've got to this point uh, where we only have 1% uh, of the total uh, forests in, in British Columbia um, as old growth. So uh, it is quite a dire situation, and I think sometimes it does take the youth to, uh, to bring it to our attention that, that it does need to be addressed now. Any further questions or comments? The item was just for receipt. Oh, Director Hamir. Well, I'm wondering if the board would then entertain after we receive this um, uh, a motion to um, to write that letter that uh, Director Hillian just mentioned. We can wait and see. Um, I'll make that motion once we once we receive. Okay, it's a vote is full board. Anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And Director Hamir? Yes, if I could make a motion to um, send a letter to the, um, the Premier outlining our concerns as was um, discussed today at, at, uh, at our meeting. Second. Thank you, Director Grave. And is there any further comments? Okay, so vote the full board. Anyone opposed to writing the letter? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to item two. It's follow up to the Friends of Rails to Trails delegation that we had at the last meeting. Move your seat. Director Hillian and Morin, thank you. Yeah, so I just wanted uh, to be able to bring that back so that we could respond uh, to the delegation. Um, you know, right now is, uh, is a perfect time to invest in infrastructure when uh, there's an economic crisis and, and things uh, aren't going well. That's a great time for upper levels of government to invest and, and maybe it's a, a good idea to put some sort of time limit on that um, investment. But for now, I think we should probably go and uh, get some more information um, from the Island Corridor Foundation and uh, see what they have to say um, about where they're at currently and what, um, give us an update on their, on their work. Director Grave. Thank you, may I ask our representative on the, uh, on the Corridor Foundation when their AGM is being held? Uh, are you asking that of Director Arbor? Yes. Director Arbor, are you able to respond to Director Gray's question? You have to unmute yourself. You get star six to unmute yourself. Well, I don't think he's able to do that. Then I, I don't want to be the one to let the cat out of the bag and I'll just keep mum at this point. Thank you. Okay, I think we do have other questions. Oh, Madam Chair, I just got a text from Director Arbor to answer the question the uh, end of May for the AGM. End of May for the next AGM for the Island Corridor Foundation. Well, if I may, I would suggest that we uh, do an invitation after the end of May uh, to ask the uh, 
the, whoever the, the chair and co-chair are to uh, come and make a presentation to the Comox Valley Regional District. Thank you. Great, if you want to uh, make that requested action with the addition after we've um, received the item. So we are in receipts. It's vote, vote of the full board, anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing then that's carried. Director Grebe, would you like to make a recommendation? I'd like to ask the, the, uh, the staff uh, to request uh, a delegation from uh, the uh, Island Corridor Foundation uh, to come and make a presentation in June to the Comox Valley Regional District Board. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. McCullough, Chair, thank just, you. Chair, just as a point of order. Yes. That's essentially the resolution that uh, is in the requested action if the word June is inserted in it. So. Yes, that's good. I think that was the desired intent, yeah. So we will move it as, as that. That'll be the motion, the same, the same requested action, but just, just insert after June. So after the AGM, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grief. And that was seconded by Director McCollum. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing and seeing none, I'll call the question. Anyone opposed? And that's carried unanimously. And Madam Chair, Director Arbor would like you to know that you have an open invitation to attend the AGM if you so wish as well. Great, thanks so much for the invitation. Okay, and so we um, are going to move in camera according to 91K, which we had already voted on previously. Thank you so much. Please stay on the line. 